Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. With this Sunday's reading and next Sunday's reading, they are very long, so if you need to sit, sit. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned for this man, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask him, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, He is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. 
Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And please pray with me. May the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, our Gospel reading this morning is yet another story of what happens when someone is encountered by this Jesus. And this is a rich, dense, long text that I could preach literally dozens of sermons on, let alone just one. And I'll be honest, I am sorely tempted to try. But I also remember the story of the great German Bible scholar, Bishop de Bailey's, who was delivering a lecture in America and cited the old German proverb saying, the head bone can only absorb what the tailbone can endure. <laughs> and so I'll be limiting my comments to just one particular aspect of our story this morning. But even so, please note a lot of the interesting things here. How a formerly blind man is finally able to see what his perfectly sighted betters will not, cannot. And notice the concept of spiritual blindness and how only Jesus can provide the light to lift that darkness. And the way that the man's faith develops, evolves, only under pressure. And how this man's identity is changed by this Jesus. Formerly, he is defined only by his handicap, the man born blind. But by the end of the story, through this encounter with Jesus, he becomes a follower of the Son of Man. He gets a new identity. And finally, notice how this healed blind man is a model for all of us. Because, notice, he is called to be a witness in Jesus' absence. It's in the absence of Jesus that he is called to testify. Indeed, much of the action of this story takes place with Jesus off stage. Just like with all of us until Jesus returns. And I find all of that fascinating. But what really strikes me is a question just behind the story. How do we discern the presence and activity of God in the events of daily life? Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, none of us here would say anything like that. But, we might say, so where is God in all of this? And to hear the words of our psalm this morning, Psalm 77, is to discover that it has always been thus. For even when God acted definitively and decisively in delivering Israel through the sea, that great watershed event of the whole Old Testament, even there, it is not easy to understand just how God was present your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. And surely many of us, indeed perhaps all of us, have had times when we thought that way, an unexpected job loss, the death of a loved one, 
a chronic illness, a, a broken dream, a bitter disappointment. In all of these things, it is hard to trace the footprints of a loving God. Like the psalmist, we have to confess to God, I knew you were there, but for the life of me, I could not see where or, or how. People handle, or I should say, mishandle, the issue of God's presence amidst the difficulties of this life in various ways. Some opt for a kind of impersonal fatalism. Whatever it will be, will be. You hear that. But that's not a real option for a believer because it is the ultimate denial of God's presence and purpose in human affairs. Such a view offers no strength for our living, no help in our striving, no hope in our dying. It reaches out in the darkness and finds only darkness. Another response to the issue of God's presence amidst difficulties of life is to attribute suffering to God's willful or even punitive intention. Something like this lay behind the disciples' question. I mean, it was natural in that culture where illness and physical suffering were understood as divine punishment. The disciples assumed that God had caused this affliction as a punishment for sin. And so they asked, whose sin is being punished? But Jesus would have none of that. Neither. He answered, thus lifting the weight of guilt and shame from this poor family already burdened enough without having bad theology multiply their misery. There is no moral meaning to the man's blindness. Not that his birth and blindness were outside of God's purpose and, and control. Not at all. Not indeed. At the end of this story, he is able to see what other sighted people cannot. And his blindness makes him transparent to what God is doing in his Christ. So do not try to relate moral uh, meaning to natural evil, to the uncreated chaos that still abounds and threatens God's good order. Do not ask whether the people killed in that landslide in Washington or who died in that plane crash in the Indian Ocean are more guilty, more sinful than others. Jesus says, I tell you no. Instead, ask how in this calamity the powerful grace and gracious power of God might come to light. Do not, however, correlate it to a merciless, graceless understanding of God's ways with God's children so that it ceases to be what it is. A calamity that is wrong, that is presumptuous, that is blasphemous. Indeed, indeed we read in our English translations he was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. But maybe a much closer rendering of the original Greek text would be something like this. Neither of his parents nor he himself sinned. He was just born blind. Period. There is no conjunction between these two clauses in Greek. Rather, let the works of God be made manifest in him. God did not willfully cause this man's misfortune. But that being the case, let it be an opportunity for God's works to be made manifest. And you see, that's something that we can all claim in our own lives, no matter what circumstances we face. No matter what happens, we can say, nevertheless, let God's work be made manifest in this. And then follows a statement that for this gospel is the interpretive key both to the healing of the blindness 
and even more to the mystery of Jesus himself. Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. If the psalmist speaks of the untraceable footsteps of God, of the hidden presence of God, the evangelist takes Jesus and stands him before us as the one in whom God meets and addresses us in person. Indeed, we have seen in Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus and with the Samaritan woman, the evangelist is saying that in this one who declares, I am the light of the world, in what he says and in what he does and in who he is, here is God who from the very foundation of the world has pledged himself to us. In this one, God takes his place beside us. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The question for us is, can you and I believe that? Do we? Indeed, dare we? I mean, nothing in this story would make you think that believing could be an easy business. The blind man himself came only gradually and haltingly and under pressure to understanding and confession. His healing did not suddenly make everything clear. It did not yield immediately to faith and worship. And in fact, throughout the Gospels, the miracle stories are told not so much to create faith as to testify in faith and then only in retrospect only in what I call holy hindsight can we look back and see how God was at work so the miracle stories testify in faith to the mysterious presence and power of God in this Jesus and even so, the miracle stories remind us of the possibility of God's presence and power breaking into our existence. The very same power of God whose word brought order out of chaos and whose word made flesh in Jesus of Nazareth continues to overcome chaos with meaning and purpose brokenness with wholeness, darkness with light, death with life. If we find the miracle stories a problem for faith, are we so different from the characters in the stories themselves? I mean, notice the man born blind, now healed of his blindness, at first referred only to the man called Jesus. Then, under pressure of the Pharisees questioning, he was willing to go so far as to call Jesus a prophet. But he only finally allowed himself the very dangerous admission that Jesus was from God after his second interrogation. And even at the end of the story, when he's been cast out of the synagogue, even as his parents feared, and when Jesus finds him and asks, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answers, and who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. In his inability to see even then, was this man different from the psalmist? Was he really any different from any of us? Your path was through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Blind from birth, his eyes now open, he still could not see, did not understand that in this man called Jesus, God had come to him and he had been with God. The story seems to suggest to us that the door of recognition, call it the door of saving faith, 
cannot be opened from our side. It can be opened only from God's side. God has to take the initiative with us. Yes, even faith is the gift of God. Even and especially when we cannot see His footprints in the mighty waters. Even when we do not recognize Him coming to us, bringing His grace and mercy to us in person. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave? What can the believer say about the presence of God amidst all the difficulties of life? And the light of God's gracious presence and power shining into the darkness of our world. A world that will not heed and yet cannot extinguish it. Well, one thing that we have to admit And one thing with which Jesus Himself lived willingly and without protest is that human existence in this world is both free and limited. We are free, but we are also finite, limited creatures. And we can be both the beneficiaries and the victims of this freedom and these limits. Under certain conditions, accidents do happen, often with tragic and heartbreaking consequences. And the uncreated chaos continues to threaten God's good and gracious order. Airplanes disappear. Landslides swallow whole communities. A child is born blind. All as if nature, cold and impersonal, were saying, I care nothing about you, your hopes and your dreams. They're all immaterial to me. And there's no power to appeal to beyond me. Then, then there are the direct consequences of our sins. Addiction, alienation, Abuse, families suffer, cycles of of violence perpetuate unabated. We are punished often enough by our own sins and the sins of others. We do not need to fall into the disciples' mistake of attributing suffering to God's punishment for our sins. Our faith, however, is able to see past these impersonal workings of nature and the willful violence of human beings. See through all the way to the merciful heart of God. This is the deepest meaning of Jesus' words in verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In and through Jesus, God is with us as the light, even in the heart of darkness, the darkness of sin and guilt, of the darkness of personal suffering, the darkness of death. In Christ Jesus, God has thrust Himself into the deepest darkness of the human condition. God takes our guilt, our grief, our brokenness into His own great heart and makes it His own, even as we are His own. This means that nothing happens in this world that can ever take us out of God's presence or separate us from God's love. Accidents, circumstances, personal and and family tragedies, as real and as devastating as they are, none of these ever gets the last word. God has the last word. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, God for us, in life and in death and beyond. To trust one's life to this God who meets us in Jesus Christ is not to believe that only good things will come our way. That God wants you to have that new Mercedes 
Or that God will always order life on our own terms? No. It is rather to know that in times of uncertainty and sorrow, God is not far off. That whether in life or in death, we and those whom we love are in God's hands. And that darkness does not speak last. But that God upholds us, sustains us, accompanies us through the valley of every shadow. Yes, our lives are in God's hands. And even when we fall, we fall into the arms of our waiting Father. In the life, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has left visible footprints on this earth. We trust that in spite of everything else, those footprints belong to a God who can be worshipped and trusted who can be questioned and argued with, but who, in any case, will write the final chapter to the human story and will ever remain with and hold to and provide for His children. Amen.